you know, that was neat. I, I just really, really, it just was a neat, neat thing, you know. <laughs> what a blessing, what a blessing. We, um, you know, we put together that, uh, that's really a live recording that we're, that we've made available to our fellowship, you know, and it is available tonight if you wanted it. But we were talking about it when Byron had the project uh, moving and moving to its conclusion, and I thought, you know, it's, you know, as I was listening to the rough cuts and everything, I started thinking, boy, this is just, just a, a blessing. I thought, well, wouldn't it be neat if we as a fellowship just revisited that, and that's why we did that tonight. And so glad you were able to make it tonight for our time of worship and all. And we're also obviously going to have our Bible study, and then at its conclusion, we do have our water baptism. And so what we'll do is I'm going to take you into Hebrews as we're continuing our study, chapter 13. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6 tonight. You might want to open your Bibles to that. And then at the conclusion of this study, I'm going to give to you a short teaching out of uh, Romans chapter 6 related to a baptism, and then I'm going to go put my Speedos on and get into the pool. <laughs> Just kidding. As you are opening your Bibles to that chapter, uh, as you already know, tomorrow night we do continue our monthly prayer meeting for those who are praying for prodigals, and that takes place at 7 o'clock. So I invite you, if you have a prodigal you're praying for, to be there with us tomorrow night. On Wednesday, we continue our study in the Gospel of Luke. We are in chapter 9, and we'll continue our study in that chapter Wednesday night. And fellas, I do invite you to come to our men's breakfast that is coming up in September. And if you'd like to, uh, to sign up for that and, and come and all, we'd encourage you to do so tonight, if you can, before you leave. Today we're in chapter 13 here in Hebrews. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 6. So allow me to read these six verses to you. And what we're going to be looking at really is a study on Christian living. And the first verse that we see here in chapter 13 really says it all. So beginning at verse 1, Hebrews chapter 13, reading to verse 6, the writer writes, Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, or so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them and those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. So the writer has been giving a series of exhortations concerning Christian living throughout this particular book. And up until the conclusion of chapter 11, he's been giving a great deal of doctrine. Beginning with chapter 12, he began to communicate practical application of this doctrine. We need to remember that much of the New Testament follows this pattern, theology first and then practice. You have doctrinal instruction and then practical application. It's doctrine to duty, it's creed to conduct, and that's because belief produces behavior. You see that in the way that the Lord communicated His Word to us. A good example is found in what we call the Ten Commandments. You see, the first four commandments... Uh, actually detail man's relationship to God. It's been referred to as being vertical and theological. When you look at those commandments, God said, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Those are th vertical and those are theological. But the next six commandments are horizontal and ethical. They are the practical outworking of the first four commandments. He says, honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So you first begin with a relationship with God, and then second, you have a practical outworking of it. When Jesus was asked, what is the great commandment in the law? He said, the first is, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, he is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with everything that's within you. And he said, there's a second like unto the first, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You have that vertical relationship with God, loving God with everything that is within you, and then you have that horizontal 
where you love people. And so you see that throughout the scriptures. You see it from Genesis to Revelation, and there are various places you can look where you'll see that. In 1 John, for example, in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, John said, the man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him, and this is how we know we are in him. And so if I say that I know him, I will do what he commands. If I say that I know him and do not do what he commands, then I don't have a true relationship with God. And John said it's very practical and it's very easy to understand. So the theology must be practically expressed through a life of obedience. When John was writing there in 1 John, he was actually contrasting intellectual faith with genuine Christian faith. And that's because the church has always been filled with counterfeit Christians. They profess verbally but deny practically. And that's why he was saying that a true belief produces a behavior. When you actually have a relationship with God, it changes the way that you live. So in 1 John 3, 16 through 18, he says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. And if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Beloved, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Intellectual faith, which we call a head faith, and a said faith versus a changing faith or a genuine one, a, a faith that transforms you. And so that's why chapter 12 had so much exhortation to the church, and that's why in chapter 12 the writer began to exhort the church to run this great race that has been marked out for them because theological knowledge must be worked out in a person's life. So, the writer has been instructing the Hebrews to establish their understanding of God because what we think about God determines our relationship with one another and the world that we live in. Chapter 13 begins with practical application, and that's what we'll be looking at today. And the commands that he gives really relate to love and its expression, its expression amongst people. He mentions its expression amongst Christians, and, and we're to love strangers and prisoners and those in need, and that's what we'll be looking at as we look at chapter 13, verses 1 through 6. So begin with me in verse 1, and notice how he says, let brotherly love continue. Brotherly love. Brotherly love is a natural outflow of a Christian life. Uh, when you have love for, for one another as the family of God, it reveals that we understand that we are family members, that we believers belong together. When you have love for somebody who is not related to you physically, but you do have a genuine concern for them and a love for them because they're a believer, it demonstrates that you understand what it means to be a Christian because love is the evidence that we have a relationship with God. It actually helps us to know to have a personal witness, to know that you have a relationship with God. And I need to hasten to add that love is not just, just a feeling. It's not an emotion alone. It's a wonderful, a wonderful feeling, and, and it's great to have. But I have to tell you the truth, and everybody in this room probably already knows this, but allow me to, to say it anyway, you know, for me, love is, is a lot more than a feeling. I mean, Marie and I have been together for a good long time now, and, and uh, I don't know that the feelings are always exactly the same. I mean, sometimes people say, well, what happens if you fall out of love? I don't, I don't know that you fall out of love any more than you fell into love, really. You grow into love, and love is really a choice. It's a decision, decision of the will. It, it's, it's, it's just a, a growing sense of commitment, and, and it, feelings are there, but but not all the time. I mean, you know, I'm sure when she wakes up in the morning and I have that morning breath and I turn towards her and say, hey, I, I don't think she's thinking, I love this man. I, I'm fairly certain she's saying, you know, when she, you know, takes the pillow off of her face and all, she probably just wants me to go brush my teeth. I mean, you know, love is just, it's just not always feelings. And sometimes we think that it is. It's, it's really a commitment. It's a decision of the will. It, it's a pursuit in the, for the long haul in the same direction with an individual that you're committed to. And, and there are moments of ecstasy. There are moments of, gosh, I'm so in love and I really understand it. And the birds are singing and, and the, you know, the clouds part and the sun bursts through and then you run in slow motion and all of that. You know, most of the time it's just, can you throw out the trash? I mean, love is, you know, it's very, very practical.